I wouldn't say that quite a number of them tried to do them, write their memoirs, but they were also, like in the, co in the course of Prop, the, the, the character of Prop is uh, one of those who were in the forefront, uh, uh, who was in the forefront, but he was also someone who actually constantly battled being the, the, the person he wanted to be, outside of the person that he, um, the, the person that people see him as. And that is something we don't talk about, you know. What becomes of the heroes, what becomes of our heroes? How do they cope with their lives outside of the, um, of the, of the advocacy they push? Who are they, who are, who are those people? And you see that in Prof constantly dealing with his personal lives, de dealing with his um, troubles, um, he's got personal issues, he's got uh, relationship issues, he's just human. And we don't see those things, you know. So, I, I, I look at the bigger picture, but at the same time, I'm also looking at those things that we fail to concern ourselves with. And these are the things that make people, you know. I mean, Prof returns back home and um, he's forgotten. Um, his comrades be have become ministers, advisors to the president. You know, is that the fate that awaits the activists when they return back home? Those with ideals, those that want to fight a c for a cause. Because it, it, it kind of like, it, when I was reading that, I was like, wow, okay, so this is highly demoralizing, you know? And it is real as well, because we know so many people that go through that, and a lot of people that have sold out. I don't know if it's the fate, but it's the fate of what, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's not the fate of the activists, but it's what exists here at this time in our country. And I guess that's one of the things someone like Prof is battling with. He's an idealist, he has come back to, to that space where he, he felt he was trying to change the world or trying to change um, the, uh, the, the mindset of the people. But he returns to a place where Nothing has changed, you know? And that in itself is, is um, demoralizing for him. And his disintegration starts from there. His mind begins to disintegrate from there. That sense of having, um, of being in a place where you can do nothing, you know? There's nothing worse than assuming that you have power and realizing that that power doesn't really exist. So, um, I wouldn't say it's the fate of the activists to return to things like that. I would say it is, it's, 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 the, it's the context, it's the way things are, you know. And I don't know if it's possible to change that, you know. It's that ability, inability to attempt to change things and, and being unable to change it. Um, that is the, that, that, that is my own, um, basic concern that's with the novel, novel that's uh, that m the margin between being able to change and being unable to change things you know always being powerless even when you have power pa prof has power from the perspective that people like him they like the idea of prof but they don't like the person that he becomes they don't like what they see you know they like the idea that Prof is someone who is an active, who has fought for them, is the person out there. But when he comes to, comes to the streets and they see him, they do not see their hero. So he's got power in him, he's got people power, but he's powerless. You, so that, yeah, so that's, that's, that's what I mean, I mean. So talking about what eventually becomes of the activist in that sense, it's, I mean, it's complicated, it's complex. How do you, how do you resolve that? So let's talk about Desire, um, your female protagonist. She kind of hero worships Prof. They've had an encounter when she was little and that's motivated her to also become some kind of activist and also take life and matters into her own hands. But when you see the way they engage in the dark and how she tries to learn out, you, you kind of have the feeling that at what, um, there's, there's that fascination and that attraction that they constantly play with, but 
they never quite get there where you hope they might. Okay, you're talking about the sexual tension between them. And not only the sexual, but amongst many things, definitely. Oh, well, um, I, I, I think there's a very thin line between um, sexual tension and anger and, and frustration, actually, as well. So, yeah, that's one, one of the things I was trying to p play with there. So, um, she's dealing with the past. She's dealing with um, the trauma of her childhood. He's dealing with the trauma that he's facing at the time, and then that from his past as well. So, you know, there's something about things that are unspeakable. When you find no words for some, uh, when you find no words for some things, it builds up this um, tension inside of the person. And there's this connection. And I mean, it's, it has always fascinated me how um, we don't interpret this, you know. When people are angry sometimes with themselves, they have sex, you know, True. kind of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you've got people that are, um, friends and all of that, and there's always a thin line between what becomes of our anger, what do we make of it, you know? And maybe it doesn't necessarily have to lead to sex, like didn't lead to sex in the case, in, in, in its, uh, between prof and desire, but it's, it's, um, it helps us to explore their person. What, what do you do with the frustration? What do you do with the grievance? You know, all of those things, yeah. I mean, June 12th was quite a traumatic episode in the history of Nigeria, and you were a teenager, right, around yeah. that time, maybe probably 13, 14, thereabouts, 17. right? 16, 17. Excuse me? 16, 17. 16, 17. So what made you want to revisit that June 12th? Well, I, I guess everybody has um, um, some memory of June 12th. Um, what are your memories? Oh, well, uh, I think I was around my mom's shop, and one of the very strong, mem uh, vivid memories I hold was everybody on the streets, you know. Um, oh, no, 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 I think that, that I'm mixing that up with the Abacha, uh, yeah, when everybody was jubilating. Yes, I was, I was, I was 13, 14, yeah. I was, I was, I was mixing the Abacha, yeah, but, yeah. Yeah, so I think, um, I, I, I think there's this thing about June 12, which is it's, it's very um, important and it's very relevant to the, the, if Nigeria were a person, to that sense of selfhood, you know, the Nigerian selfhood as Nigerian person. And I, I find it fascinating in, in, with how it has formed that Nigerian personhood, you know, seeing Nigeria as a person now, how it has unraveled us, how we have begun to, perhaps that was something that fascinated me. You know. As a young person, I, I, I wouldn't have thought I would have dealt with it the way I, I did. But, you know, you read history, you interact with people, you see how um, our nation, what our nation is becoming, and it's always, it's always a point of reference, you know, it's always a point of re reference. That's why I said, if we have to consider Nigeria as a person, there's that um, sense of how it has unraveled and what it has made of us. Yeah. Um, Jumoke, I know you as a poet, so your transition into prose now, um, how was that for you? Did it come easy? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I've, Done prose, I mean, for a while now, but I bought, I'll probably poetry, more, more poetry. Yeah, yeah, more poetry. I yeah. mean, this is your f debut novel, right? Yeah. I've published a few short stories. Uh, but it just happens that my novel is coming out now. And whenever, which, you know. So, whatever form I write in, there's always that sense of trying to make new sense of that genre which I have tried to do here. And one of the driving points of um, being a poet, poet is that you're always trying to find the, the in-between, you know? Um, trying to deal with emotions, trying to deal with the unspeakable, trying to deal with the essence. And yeah, 
you would always find that in my writing, and you find that in my prose as well. So I, I'm still a poet. Okay. So we should be expecting a collection soon? Oh, I mean, I don't know what you should expect. I'm writing by me. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> You're not going to put me in a spot. <laughs> On a spot, yeah. So um, I know you deliberately chose a Nigerian publisher and a Nigerian team, um, which is something quite fascinating because, I mean, everybody wants to go international, global. They're looking for those... Um, European or American publishing houses to make it big, to land in all the fuitons. And here you are saying you want to bring it back home. It is important that it starts from home. It's a Nigerian story. It is our story. You know, um, I remember when I was a teenager, Wale um, Oguntoko said something, and he said, was, was, we were driving home, and he said, Jumaka, do you know that... Um, there's no point if nobody knows your story outside of your home. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't have a problem with being global. I, I don't think, I, I've written poetry that, yeah. If anybody comes to- We spoke about that yesterday and it was very, very important for you to work with a Nigerian editor because um, you felt that someone from Europe or somebody with a different background wouldn't fully appreciate what you were bringing to the table. Um, I'm Yoruba, and I'm immersed in that. Even if I don't, um, I mean, I don't write Yoruba as fluently as, and speak it as fluently as I want, I would like to. But I take, uh, and I needed somebody who, who actually will understand that. So the editing pro process involves that going back, I mean, to back and forth with someone who could see where I was coming from, you know? Someone who understand that part of it, that I was, not only, was I, um, not only am I trying to tell a Nigerian story, I'm also trying to emphasize how I am a part of that story, what, what I am in that story. So we have so many cultural groups in, in Nigeria, but I'm a Yoruba in Nigeria, and I'm speaking from a Yoruba point of view. And I always appreciate that point of view when someone else Shakiri speaks from that point of view. It brings a sense of, um, it, it tells you how, how vibrant and how essential it is to tell. Talking about Yoruba, I really appreciated what you did with the Oriki, you know, how you kind of illustrated the beauty of the language, the musicality, and the poetry as well. And somehow I kind of felt like that kind of grounded prof and also is might be a vehicle to healing as well, you know, like our archived memories, you know, in, in something like the Oriki. Um, when I was growing up, my grandmother would read um, uh, Oriki to us whenever we do something. Um, for those who don't know what Oriki is? It's a panegyric, like praise chant. That's what it is, you know. Um, so she would recite it to us and you know that's a way of that's a way of getting um paid kind of <laughs> <laughs> so she would recite it to us and tell us um, so when prof begins to have problems with his mom um the oriki is a way of bringing him taking him back to his um origin you know, there's this thing they say, they'll say, remember the child of who you are, run to your mother, you won't she, you know. So it's that idea, that remember who you are, remember the child of whom, whom you are, remember the person you are. So reciting the Oriki is just a way of um, helping Prof return to his, to his origin. That, so yeah, that's it. I mean, what struck me about your book is the sadness weighing in on all characters and how despite their defiance and determination to survive and fight the system and all the injustice around them, they are still rem reminded of how small and how powerless they are. You know, and that is like something you see across the board all over the continent, you know. There's like that feeling of, immediate urgency towards change and then you know 
we are always going to somehow return back to the status quo. I could ask you a question in return. What do you <laughs> <laughs> playing the devil? How do you feel during elections? Excuse me. How do you feel during elections? I was depressed. Seriously? <laughs> I, um, no, but you mean how I felt during elections? Yeah, I mean, generally, how do you feel when elections are conducted? No, there's always a sense of excitement, and I partake in elections, obviously. Mm. Yeah. Do you feel power? I mean, that you have power that you can I feel really till I go to the polling station, and then I see that they don't have the the, the, the ballot she sheets, or I see as somebody runs away with the papers or with the ballot boots or whatever they yeah. call it. Yeah, yeah. So the using board. that context, yeah. that sense of going through the ballot station, feeling powerful and suddenly becoming powerless, you know, seeing that they, you have absolutely nothing you know, yeah, across Africa, you can see it. Same people come back, you know, nothing really changes, really. So we, we, we are a people who 